Hello. Hello. I thought we'd start with a bit of eye um, revision. So have a look at the picture. Pause the video and let's see how many you can get right. OK, you're back. Good. Which two show muscles? Well, that's F. That's the iris. That's a muscle. And C. That's the ciliary muscle. OK, again, the iris. You can see the other side of the iris here and the ciliary, ciliary muscle look very similar, especially in a diagram like this. Their position means means what they are. So, yeah, this must be the pupil in the center. So, yeah, hard one. And, and a lot of people are finding it difficult between understanding what the iris does, controlling the pupil size and therefore light entry and the ciliary muscle that controls the lens. I think, you know, ciliary is C-I-L-I. -I. It's got one L in it. Is it one L or two? You know, that's our decision. Yeah. And it's like, oh, how do you spell ciliary? Well, the L is the hard bit. Yeah. Well, lens begins with L as well. So think ciliary with lens and you're probably halfway there to understanding how it works. Uh, which two refract light? Well, that's the cornea, A. That's the curved surface here. And the curved lens, D. So A and D. Which two are transparent? A and D. They need to be to refract light. If they were opaque, they couldn't refract light. They would just absorb light. OK, so, yeah, the same goes there. B is just the sclera. That would be the white outer part of the eye. And two pieces, of, two pieces of evidence from the diagram that the eye is focusing on a near object. Well, the suspensory ligaments E is slack or under no tension and the lens is rounded or thick. OK. Again, the hard bit is understanding the cornea how that refracts light and how its shape can be adjusted. The iris changing shape to control the pupil, that's okay, but people confuse it with the ciliary muscle. How the lens works is really tricky. Um, and again, it's knowing about the, the fact that you need a fat lens for close objects because you need to do a lot of refraction to, to, re, to refract the light, to focus it on the fovea right at the back of the eye. So yeah, there's a test next lesson on the on the eye and nervous system. So hopefully that's a, a quick, nice run through for you. So, so now we're going we're to get back onto body temperature. So it says modeling the effect of sweating on body temperature. So here's a really poor method for doing it. They're going to fill two boiling tubes with hot water, cover one boiling tube in a paper towel, put both boiling tubes in a boiling tube rack close to a fan. They're going to add water to, to the paper towel, start the stop clock, start the fan and record the temperature of the water bath in both tubes. Zzz, should be an S on the end, sorry. Record temperature throughout the experiment and then repeat the experiment to remove anomalies. So this would be a six mark question. They'd, they'd tell you what was available. They would, say, they would say that there's test tubes and paper towels and thermometers um, and a drop in pipette and things like that. So it, is, it, it tends to show you them as a picture and then ask you to describe how you would use them. So, and this isn't a required practical anyway, so you're not meant to have met it before anyway. Um, yeah, so that'll get two out of six because at least the recording temperature and it's in a logical order, okay? However, it, nothing specific, it's all vague. And then all we're gonna do during class is how do I improve another one? Well, instead of fill two boiling tubes, I can say put 50 centimeters cubed of water in. Yeah, so I'll give a volume. I think a boiling tube holds about 60 centimetres cubed, so that'll be quite full for a boiling tube. With hot water, well, I'll probably put a temperature with water at 70 degrees C. OK, I've made it specific. Um, cover one boiling tube in a paper towel. How am I going to put it like one layer thick, two layers thick, three layers thick? Am I going to kind of wrap it around numerous times? It's just going to be one kind of one, one kind of like thickness of paper towel. Exactly. Um, which I could go through. The most important bit, though, is that I can't have one inner paper towel that I'm going to get wet to simulate sweating and one that's not going to paper towel on, because that's not a fair test. I need to show that it's the wet paper towel that's had the effect, not the paper towel. So I need to have a paper towel on both boiling tubes. OK, so that would make it a far better experiment. OK, would make it a fair test. I never write fair test. In, as my answer, I, I give a specific thing like I will put them, they both have a paper towel on so that any difference is due to the, the simulated sweat 
with the water, not the paper towel. Three, it says put both boiling tubes in a boiling tube rack close to a fan. How close to a fan? Put a distance, put a fan speed, things like that. Add water to the paper towel. Stop the stop. I think this needs to be that we we need to have the thermometers in to start with. I, do, I can't have a th one with a thermometer in that I then have to start it and then put that into another one at the same time. Um, yeah, it doesn't make sense. So I'm going to put, it's better with a number four saying place the thermometer in both boiling tubes, wait for them to get to temperature, then start the stop clock, start the fan, record the temperature. Um, and also, you know, how much water am I putting on the, the paper towel? Yeah, completely drench it, soak it, add one centimetre cube. There's lots of ways of improving number four. Five, record temperature throughout the experiment. Yeah, vague. Record the temperature every minute for five minutes is far better. I repeat the experiment to remove anomalies. If I repeat it once, I've got two sets of data at each time. That does not mean I can spot an anomaly. Yeah, I would have to repeat the experiment twice and then remove anomalies. OK, and, and then calculate a mean. OK, so six is a bit vague as well. But yeah, so re repeat the experiment twice. Um, remove anomalies and calculate a mean will be really, really good. OK, and if you get like improve each one to six in one way, that would easily get six marks in an exam rather than two marks. OK, so yeah, relatively easy. No more revision there. There's nothing extra to learn. It's just it's the practical skills that you've been picking up all throughout your, your, your time um, in school, hopefully. Right, next, so um, hopefully you've got the sheet downloaded, ideally printed, if not, you might struggle a bit, but you can probably do it on screen. I did mine on screen, so it, was, so it wasn't too bad. So again, now's the, now's the time to pause it. I'm just gonna start going through the answers. So yeah, it's better to get it wrong first and then see why it's right, rather than just listen, listening to me and nod along thinking, oh yes, I would have put that. So yeah, pause it now. You're back after a grueling 10 minutes of work, excellent. Right, so first one asked about the um, working out the initial rate of cooling. So yeah, we, we draw a tangent of a line that shows how steep it is right at the start. So that red line shows how steep the, the line was right at the start. Okay, my line of best fit. And I now need to know the gradient of that line. Well, that's gradient equals y over x. Simple math skill. So I'd, 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 I've effectively made a big triangle here. So the y distance is, um, well, there it is. If the gradient is, well, it's a negative gradient for one. So it's losing. So I need a minus. And that's 49. I put 49.3. It could be 49.4 or 5. Minus 20. Yeah, it's not starting at zero. Is my triangle. It's starting at 20. So I need to know that difference. Divided by 3 point, well, it's not 3.1, it's not 3.0, it's be yeah, about 3 point, I thought 3.07, it could be 3.06. So, um, so yeah, minus 9.5 degrees C per minute. So therefore the cooling rate at the start was 9.5 degrees C per minute. It cooled quickly at the start and then it's, cool, it's cooling slower and slower and slower and slower and slower. By here, there's hardly any gradient. It's barely cooling now. It's got to its almost maximum maximum cool state okay then you need to draw the line for y equals minus 3x plus 50 well 50 is the y intercept so it starts at 50 and then i can just put well just plug 5 in x equals 5 so 3 times 5 is 15 so, so it's minus 15 plus 50 so that comes into 35 so then i can just join those points because it says a straight line so that's my dry boiling tube with just a single layer just just with the paper towel on a dry paper towel covering the boiling tube full of hot water at 50 degrees c so that's cooled in a linear fashion rather than a curvy fashion i suggest it would be curvy it just pretty isn't just showing up on this scale okay so again simple math skill um, and then we have these questions calculate how many times faster the initial cooling of the tube was the sweat tube compared to the dry tube so yeah, the sweat was 9.5. We worked that out. The dry is 3 degrees C per minute because it's y equals mx. 3 is the three is the is the gradient. So that's 3 degrees C per minute. So yeah, 9.5 divided by 3 is 3.2 times faster. One decimal place given. Well done again. Me. 
Um, for a sketch line the graph for what you would expect for a sweat tube that was placed 25 centimeters from the fan. So this one was 50 centimeters. So now it's a lot closer, a lot more air movement, a lot more evaporation, a lot more cooling. So it's going to be steeper, but it's going to plateau or level out at the same point. So if you just go back to the graph, it's going to be start at 50. It's going to be steeper coming down. But it's not going to dip below really because this one's almost got to the same point. You shouldn't really be going below 22 degrees C. Okay, so steeper, but yeah, it just gets to the to that temperature faster. Hard one for the second bark. Um, the room temperature was 25 degrees C. Calculate how long it would take the dry no sweat tube to reach room temperature so that means i'm making y equal 25 in my y equals minus 3x plus 50. so plug those numbers in so x is what i'm trying to find that's the time in minutes y is 25 um, degrees c and therefore that comes in 8.3 minutes again it's just rearranging the equation that 20 yeah that um um Yeah, so 25 equals minus 3x plus 50. And then sweating is the only way that animals can cool down when the external temperature is above 37 degrees C. Evaluate, so I can say yes, because when water evaporates, it takes away heat energy from the surface, or you know, a hot surface can't radiate heat to a hotter surface. So I could I could there's numerous ways of saying that. Um, however, no, because some animals don't sweat, they pant or lick. So they do other things to uh, to cool down. Um, you know, some of them burrow out of the out of the sun's heat. Yeah, it's kangaroos that you know they lick their wrists, um, and then it, it it evaporates. But they'll also dig down into the soil where the soil's cooler, and they'll lie there under a tree in the shade and dig into cooler soil, and then just lie on the cooler soil, and then and then they can get some conduction cooling. Okay. Um, there's a couple of links of just videos that we'll just watch quickly that just show some thermal imaging fun stuff. So we'll, I'll pop them on the link. And then the last thing we're going to do is look at six mark questions. So we, we looked at one for the um, the method and then there's four more here for um, yeah for other, other things that I'm going to run through now. So again, have a go first and then come back and scribble down if you if you agree so first one describe how plants make their biomass well i can say they carry out photosynthesis um they take carbon dioxide and water light hits chlorophyll and they make glucose and oxygen so the detail of photosynthesis um is going to give me like really half of the marks but their biomass isn't just made out of glucose. Remember page Mr. Council? So I'm going to say that the glucose molecules are joined to form starch and cellulose. Um, nitrates from the soil are used to make amino acids, and therefore they're joined to form proteins. And glucose can be converted into fats as well. So it's really all that, um, what the glucose of photosynthesis can be used for. So a six more question would talk about photosynthesis, give the equation for photosynthesis, or talk through the equation, and then you'd want at least um, you know two other things that glucose can be used to make in the biomass of a plant. For that one, um, how does the eye respond to low light levels? So this is a stimulus to response question. So what detects the low light? Well, that's the retina. And then I've got nerve impulses, sensory neuron, via sensory neuron to the brain where there's relay neurons, the nerve impulse is converted to a chemical signal at a synapse, then there's nerve impulses via a motor neuron to the effector, well that's going to be the iris, the iris, muscles in the iris contract, causing the pupil to narrow or constrict. Okay, um, and if you can say that for the eye, then again you'll do well in the test. Um, Next one, how does the body prevent the liver from overheating? So yeah, the liver's inside our body. Um, so that's by blood flow. So I can say that when the body is hot, that's detected by thermal receptors in the skin or brain that send nerve impulses 
to the thermoregulatory centre via a sensory neuron. Then that sends nerve impulses to, via a motor neuron to the sweat gland that secretes sweat. It evaporates from the skin, cooling the blood in the capillaries in the skin and the cool blood flows to the liver to cool it down. Again, I don't have to give it, you know, I can miss out the odd little bit of information, but I need to be giving a, again, it's a stimulus to response, but I'm talking about the thermoregulatory centre and the thermoreceptors and the type of effector. Exactly the same as the eye. So if I stand on a pin, it's quite a simple stimulus to response. Yeah, I don't have to mention specific, you know, you know specific parts in as much, much detail, but we've learned about the eye and we've learned about how we regulate temperature and therefore we have to give specifics. And lastly, um, milk contains protein and sugar. How could you confirm this and also show it does not contain starch? So this is just six marks. I need the three tests. So proteins are tested for by the burette test. Um, and that will turn from light blue to purple or lilac. OK, you can describe the burette test, B-I-U-R-E-T, the burette test. Um, you can say it's copper sulfate and sodium hydroxide, but I will just learn the burette test. Um, sugars, you need to heat it with Benedict's solution and it turns from blue to orange or blue to red. And how could I confirm it? It doesn't contain starch. You would add iodine solution and it wouldn't turn. It would stay orange. It wouldn't turn to blue black. So that's just, can you remember the three tests for biomolecules? Um, because you've got important exams coming up. Yeah, there's a, um, a test this week. Hopefully you'll get to do the test. You know, the, the marks of tests now are quite important because who knows um, if the, um, you know, um, the government will want us to give a, give a grade from the centre again. So yeah, do yourself justice on the, on the test. So it's the nervous system and I. And in December, you'll have mock exams. Um, and therefore, again, you know, if you're finding something from these four that yeah, you don't know, now's the time to be doing something about it. So I shall sign off there. It's been a pleasure as always. Take care.